Josh Lakatos from the United States was unique for many different reasons. He competed in finals in three different disciplines at World Cup level, and I believe there are only two people on earth that have done that. He won a world double trap title and an Olympic silver medal in trap, and therefore he qualifies for our second part of Champions Week. He isn't shy, he has an opinion on everything. He's one of the biggest personalities ever in the sport of shotgun shooting. Let's find out a little more about one of the world's great all-round champions. Josh, really appreciate your time this evening for you early in the morning for us. Now, the reason why we're, we're getting you on this, the criterion, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, but you're a unique cat to get a gig on this. <laughs> because we're, we're picking five people that not only did they win an Olympic medal, they also won a world championship in a distinctly different discipline than they won their Olympic medal in. But you actually go one step further. You're one of only two people on earth that have made a final in a World Cup or a world ranking event in three different disciplines. Now, we've got a prize for this. Do you know who the other <laughs> one is? <laughs> I, I don't even want to guess. It was one of your old teammates, but we'll leave that. Someone will answer that question, but you're one of only two. Josh, it's really great to catch up with you. Um, you're looking well. How have you been? Uh, great, actually. I, um, life's been treating me pretty well since I kind of walked away from the shooting world and picked something a little different to do. And, uh, yeah, found a passion, and life's good. I can't complain. I'm still in one piece, sort of. Can we ask you, when was the last time you fired a shot in any type of competition? Oh, God. Um, probably in, I don't, I wouldn't even know the years, but I would say it's maybe late 08 or 09, just playing around. When I came back to coaching a little bit, I shot some local stuff. As far as personally, uh, my last shot, which I was actually really happy to do, was in Lanado in 2003. After I had my accident, came through all that, realized I had a, I, had a, I developed a blind spot in my eye from a race car accident and competed in another year or so after that. And it was just, it was, it was time to go. Well, we'll get to all that, but I want to take you back <laughs> to the very, very first time I met you. And uh, you've got to wind the clock back to 1991 in Perth at the World Championships. And there was you and Lance Bade for the first time together. And I could hear you both before I could actually see you. You were about <laughs> four or 500 metres away and I could hear the pair of you. Um, 91 for you was that obviously you'd you went on to become a great champion of the sport. I think you won a medal in the junior world double trap that year. And yeah. then you went on to win the, the world championship in double trap. But do you remember the first competition over in Perth? Absolutely. 91. Uh, I remember a thousand flies in our tent. I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember we had, uh, we had Rocco Barrow was our third guy. I think Erickson was there. Yeah, no, it was, it was great. I remember watching Mick, which, thank God he was a junior and competing as a man uh, and left us one more slot open. So, yeah, I remember that quite well. Yeah, I think your teammate, Lance Bade, won a medal in the uh, the Junior Worlds that year. Silver and, uh, silver and singles, I believe, yeah. That's right, yeah, because uh, Michael was a junior but decided to shoot open and he finished second, I think, to one of your other teammates. Let's fast forward the clock a couple of years. In the two years from 91 to 93 at the world titles, you had learned a lot and you gave everybody a lesson in double trap. Um, you didn't last long in double trap, but when you were shooting it, you were awesome. 93 and 94, you shot, I think you virtually made every final you shot in, but you, yeah. you shot as a junior and in the world championship and won it with a world record score. But your passion really wasn't double trap, was it? When that first came out at that time, it was literally something extra to do. Uh, they said they're going to come out with this new event. Um, it's nobody's done it. And in our minds, we just figured, well, you know what? If nobody else is really doing it, nobody's mastered it. Why don't we dive into this? We're all pretty versatile shooters. And, and I think for the first few years, it was, it was more, I, not to be arrogant or anything, but it was more just talent. If you could figure it out quick, you could, you could do well at it. It wasn't that somebody had years and years and years of training on you, which, I believe now is what it's become. Obviously people specialized in it and found their niche and you know, you obviously succeeded quite well with it, but uh, then it was still pretty wide open. And I think 
I think even more so, we didn't put as much pressure on ourselves for that. We all knew we had trap. We all knew that's what, what we wanted. But then there was this other thing. And, but that thing had the same metal and the same, okay, let's go do that thing. And so we, we really put the time in back then and just did the best we could with it. Well, um, I hate to point out the age difference here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you were well and truly training um, when I came on the circuit. And from memory, I remember seeing you at the Olympic Training Center. We had a very unique situation there, which I think went very underappreciated from a lot of other people. Um, we were wide open at the time. Uh, when I got to the training center, thankfully, and Lance of all people, believe it or not, talked me out of going into the Army. We, you know, obviously, as you guys know, our Army marching chip unit was quite, was quite solid at the time. And I just thought, well, I don't really know what I'm doing. Maybe I go there, whatever. And Lance said, you should give the training center a try. When I got there, thankfully, we were established enough that they didn't really ride us too hard about what they thought we should do. They let us do what we thought we should do. And it was open. Well, we realized we had an extra three or four hours in the day. And then Doubles Trap came on. Um, and even past that, not to jump ahead, but I was a skeet shooter when I first got into this and Carlisle of all people went, put that gun down. You're going to go shoot trap. You can always shoot skeet later. You'll figure that out. Um, but it was literally the extra time we had and they lent, they, they, we had all the facilities we needed wide open all the time we wanted. We didn't have social media. We didn't have all the extra stuff going on what were we going to do? Well, you can only hip shoot so many trap targets before you go, let's do something that matters. And off we went. So it actually, it, it provided a, a fill, if you will. Josh, you started as a skeet shooter. Your roots came into the sport. How? Where did you shoot? Where, American skeet, was it? We, you know, just recreationally. My mom and dad shot American trap and American skeet, but nothing competitive. It was all club stuff just for fun. I had a my uncle, who was a my uncle Pete, who was a big shooter and and loved to shoot model forty twos and and you know, it was literally a hobby for the family. And uh, there was a, a gentleman named Gene Studo who we knew years ago, and introduced us. And he said, you know, you should really get this kid some real lessons. He goes, I know a guy, he's pretty good. Happened to be Dan Carlisle, and that pretty much writes anybody's story. Yeah, so let, let's get on to Dan, um, because I, I know he was a big influence over yourself and many others in the United States. Um, yeah. How much of your success do you credit to Dan? He, he's more credit to my success than the time ever showed, because I didn't spend as much time with him as everyone thought. Uh, probably two years maximum, and a lot of that time I was carrying you know, sporting clays machines at Rahagi's laying targets for him to, to help him give more lessons. And yeah, we'll get over to a range at some point. And I'll dial you in later, kid. But the truth of the matter is that he got me so early that I got lucky enough that I didn't develop anything bad. He got me dialed in um, not only physically, but mentally and emotionally, which anybody that knows Carlisle, you spend a half hour with him and you can go dig a tree out of the ground with your bare hands. The guy can, he can motivate anyone to do anything. So. I think having him that early allowed me to just build the confidence, but he built a base into me that even on my worst days, I still had a shot. I mean, I look back at it now and that's kind of the best way I can put it. It's been something that we've spoken about quite a bit, just the difference between practice and competition and the importance of each yeah. of those. Yeah. How do you feel about the difference in practice and competition and which has more weight on it? I think that's person to person really. More importantly, it's a matter of people actually understanding. The practice is what's going to allow you to understand what it's like when you completely cut it loose. And then you have to get onto a competition and see, okay, what have the two things given me and where am I at? And that's where I think the coaches, even though, and, and this, is, this, this might come out really wrong, but it's not. Even though Danny never really explained that to me, he did. I just didn't understand it. I didn't have the maturity then to understand what the hell he was talking about. But looking at it later in life, he was giving it to me in the way that he figured I'd have the ability to understand. And I think that question you asked is really significant, harder for somebody super young to understand and even more so today. Nobody today wants to put years of their life at something and know in a couple of years, maybe this is going to work out. I kind of need to know now. I've got stuff to do. 
uh, there's a program on and my DVR is full. You know, they, it, 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 there's just too much going on. Whereas, and, and I remember, what did we do, Russell? Running around tournaments. Like, literally, we had nothing to do but talk to each other. We yeah, talked. We communicated. I mean, we, yeah. Josh, you talked to everybody. It wasn't just me. There was nobody. <laughs> the, the Trapper boys, you'd speak to everybody. There was nobody that you wouldn't speak to. Hey, I want to get back to Danny for a minute because yeah. – I always appreciated you. You had a different technique than what they would teach in Europe. You shot with two bent knees and you were very quick and you were very smooth. And to me, it was like watching another Dan Carlisle shoot. But it worked for you, but it doesn't work for everyone, that technique. Is that what you coach if a young shooter came to you as a trap shooter now? Not necessarily the two bent knees technique. I think a lot of people, well, really, virtually nobody really understood that my body was completely screwed up since I was eight years old. Um, I got hit by a car. I was supposed to lose my right leg. I don't walk on my toes because I'm arrogant. I swear to God it's not because I'm arrogant. It's literally because my feet don't work. And... Uh, and so I had to adapt a style. And Danny did want me to have a little bit of knee bend. I coached a broken knee, but I didn't necessarily coach a squat. I coached the ability to have the body move and be universal, but I wanted it neutral. And part of one of the hardest things I found is people would come back to me and show me a picture of me and go, I want to look like this. You, you look like you're ready to rip the hair off this target. I want to look like that. And I'm thinking... No, you don't. It's painful. It's a pain in the ass. It took me a long time to figure this out. So I didn't necessarily teach people to want to shoot just like me, but there were some things about what, what Danny and I had worked on where we, we liked the fluidity of the body. We felt that we could, if you could allow your body to move more like that, when the pressure hit, you wouldn't be as locked up and prone to quote, I hate to say choke, but tense up and, and not be able to do it. That being said, you could do it any way you wanted to do it so long as you picked something to do and you stuck with it. Again, it gets all back to that base. Your base was completely different than mine. Obviously, you didn't struggle with pressure. You know, we all dealt with it our certain way. But I think, I think as far as posture goes, I think form, you know, it's, it, for me, I did not coach the way I shot. I literally wanted to see how somebody would react. And I would throw several different things at them and see what they absorbed quickest and what made sense to their body and try to go with that. Always found you really hot or you could be really cold. One of the days or one of the, the weekends that you were really hot, which you'll, you'll remember well, was a World Cup in Lenar. No, it was Fagnano. It was in Milan Fagnano. in 1994. Um, you gave everybody and it was a world star field when we had a world championship there only a couple of months later, but at the World yeah. Cup, you just drained everybody. But then I always found it odd. Two months later at the World Championship, you're a different person. And I always wondered what happened in that eight or 12 week period. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, two nights before the competition, I, uh, Lloyd Woodhouse knocked on our door and I was walking to our door to answer the door and I caught my left foot on the edge of my gun case and I snapped both of my left toes on my front foot and well, dislocated both of them. That'll do it every time. That made things a little difficult. <laughs> Honestly, what happened at that world championship and I just suffered through it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. I never actually knew <laughs> that. So thanks Sorry. For I was so hot and cold. I just didn't really whine to anyone. It hurt like hell. I whined to Lance that night. He didn't want to hear it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you shoot on your toes like you did. Without being yeah. used to all of them, that would have been hard. You, but no, no. Getting, getting back to what you said. No, you're right. Uh, there was... There were a lot of times where I was, um, I was a little hot and cold. I also didn't have, the one thing that I didn't have that a lot of other shooters have, I didn't come from the ATA world or your DTL world. I never shot 400 targets a day. I never learned how to run 100. I don't think I ran 100 straight in my career, maybe twice, ever. In my entire career, I never ran 100 straight. Practice, I could run hundreds all day long or thousands or whatever we did training. But I never did it in a competition. I didn't have that ATA or NSSA background where I was literally used to stringing hundreds of targets together without missing, which was one of the things. And I explained all this to, my, to the people that I coach that, you know, even though we aren't supposed to really go out and grind as hard as some of the other people do, it is something you should put down range. Um, but I didn't have that. 
And so when things would go awry for me, they kind of went awry for me. We've mentioned Lance Bade. You went into the Olympics in 96 with Lance, and I think it was Brett Erickson. I think he was your mm -hmm. teammate. Um, you and Lance had a pretty good rivalry, a healthy rivalry. It was a professional rivalry. But the two of you came in when Brett Erickson was world champion in 91, and he provided a yardstick for you guys. But you and Lance sort of took it to the next level. What Lance... I always thought was one of the most consistent shots I've met him. But he never actually won a world championship. The reason we're probably speaking to you today instead of Lance was that he never actually won a world title. He won an Olympic medal and won plenty of world medals. But it must have been a healthy person, though, to have beside you as having Lance Bade. Because with the two of you on fire, you, you were always competitive. And do you think he's a reason you were successful as well. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> just having him as a training partner, um, us being able to go at each other every day, whether we happen to be getting along at the time or not, we always really pushed each other. You never went out and have a ha had a half-assed practice day. You never went out and gave 80% ever. No matter what was going on at the range at the time, you were always trying to push harder. And there were times where I'd grab him and go, get on, get over my shoulder, dude. I don't know what the hell's going on here. And he would work with me and he would do the same. And, and we did work. We worked very well that way with each other. Um, but just knowing that we were pushing ourselves to a, a, a totally different level. Um, we also had quite the rivalry with the army. And again, like I said, I was going to go there and he pulled me into that. So the first couple of years we were at the training center, I would say probably through 95 up till about 96 was, yeah, it was exactly that. We, we really wanted to break it off on those guys. And, and they knew that we got together. They knew we were going to be good. And when we started to be good, then it started getting nasty between them and us. And we just went ahead and stepped up and said, we, we really don't care. Um, we're going to do what we do. And, you know, we all got what we got. So, yeah. So, so I didn't realise there was that sort of rivalry between the trap shooters and you. I mean, you throw Dominic Grazioli in the mix and I think he was an Air Force shooter, but not based. Mm -hmm. He was based, I think, in Texas. But you right. and Nance, um, I, I think going back to the 96 Olympic Games, you were both medal. You came up against uh, Michael Diamond, who was just on fire. But one of the great shoot-offs ever was the shoot-off for the silver medal between you and Lance. And you ended up um, outlasting Lance for the silver medal. But when you think back at all the people you had as rivals, and is there anyone that you enjoyed beating more or hated getting beaten, beaten by more? Because I couldn't be anything worse than having Lance Bade beat me then have to sit on the bus with him on the way back, because that would be hell. But I mean, in a professional sense, did you take anything out of beating certain people more than others? I, you got me thinking about that now, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. No, he, he definitely was way up there. No, I mean, and, and again, and again, we, Lance and I, for, for all of our rivalries that we had, we went back and forth for years. Um, we definitely pushed each other. And, and <clears throat> I've said this a thousand times, if that shoot off was for bronze fourth, it would have gone 10 targets. Um, the fact that we both, we're at our first Olympics. We both knew we had medals in our pockets. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't want to speak for him, but for me, it was a grudge match. It was like, all right, we've, we've gone back and forth. We've been in good places with each other. We've been in bad places with each other. Here it is. Let's throw it out together. And, and this is just between you and me. So that's honestly why it went that far. And, and I'm not going to lie. I was probably a thousand to one favorite to win that. Cause as you know, I was not a first barrel guy at all. Um, and somehow it, whatever happened, happened. I mean, it was, it was literally just a between him and me thing. As far as getting on to other shooters, um, obviously Mick is, is well in there. I came from a little older school because in knowing Danny, I knew a lot of the older names. So I wanted to compete against um, a lot of the older guys and try to beat them, even though they may have been on their way out to beat some of the guys that were, you know, even five, 10 years before your era, getting into my era, I, those were the guys I really wanted to go at. But I would say, and I, <laughs> I don't mean this to sound bad in any way, it's all out of respect. Anybody with ITA on their back. If you can beat anybody with ITA on your back, you've done something. And, and honestly, I, I, I was always told if you can win in Italy, then you've done something. And, and I was very, very fortunate to get a couple over there where 
that that was probably the proudest moments because you knew those guys were tough. And it, again, it's not out of disrespect. It's out of all respect. Those guys were the benchmark. Um, the Germans, there were Germans that were the benchmark. Obviously, Mick and you were benchmarked. We, we had a, a level of people that were out there. But <clears throat> um, for me, it was some of the older guys that I'd been hearing their name since I was a kid listening to Todd Graves, Brett Erickson, you know, Mark Hobbs, all the guys from back in the days talk about these guys. Um, God, who won the 88 Olympics? Uh, Russian, who passed, unfortunately. Monikov. But thank you, Monikov. You know, and, and being able to shoot with him in 94 was like, wow, I'm kind of awestruck. I, I know I'm winning, but you're you, you know. They, so to me, I had always had a very um, – Well, there's a, there's a bit of a backstory there to Monikov. You were lucky to actually ever get to shoot against him. For those people that are listening, mm -hmm. he won the 88 Olympics and then vanished off the face of the earth. Disappeared, you know, correct. <laughs> We didn't realize um, why he disappeared off the face. Right. He actually couldn't physically be let out of the jail. He was in to come and shoot. Correct. And he comes up Correct. at the 24 World Championships, the one we were talking about, and wins the gold medal. And right. sure, I mean, you wouldn't have seen him win his Olympic gold medal or world championship. You only would have read about him. And then right. he goes and shows you how to win a world championship. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I not for other reasons, by the way, that I need to win this, but I'm still here and I'm still good. So, yeah, no, that was. Yeah. And, and as an off. And I, I mean, you could you know, there's a list of guys that you and I could lame off. Um, but yeah, though, that anybody that was the benchmark, you know, and, and in my time, obviously, Pelliello, Venturini, Scalzone, God rest his soul. I'm so sad to hear about that. Um, but I mean, you know, there, there was a handful of guys that you watched just dominate for years. Um, Cioni, Conti, you know, and it, you, you can name 50 Italians and, and, and a handful of guys. Dame was phenomenal. I mean, so there's, there was a lot of guys that, that when you got to go up against them and, and prove yourself, especially being young, to me, that was the experience that really made it worthwhile. One of the things I look back on now is I never thought of myself as that. I never thought of myself as ever being on the benchmark of those guys. And today I still really don't. Um, so I think that may have been a humbling thing that helped us get there. Something else I also found is as you're talking to your younger shooters, do a little history, Re read, read history up on our sport and read what some of these guys did back in the day. Um, it was pretty amazing, especially with the lack of technology they had to pull off some of the scores they did. I, I always thought it was amazing. Well, I think you pointed out the most important thing, the reason that the Australians and the Americans get on so well. They've got an equal uh, desire to beat the Italians. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think we all have that. Um, Absolutely. You speak about the history of our sport, and you had a very big part of the history in the sport. I'm most interested as far as what your most memorable or – biggest highlighted experience in the sport would be surprising enough it would probably not be the 96 olympics um as as much as that would be what everyone should be um and russell you'd probably agree with us i'd have to say it was barcelona in 93 for sure yeah and you actually had the comment about that that i still remember verbatim to this day um i remember this cocky little kid running around in 91 92 that thinking he was really good and then he showed up in 93, and he was really good. <laughs> and that's all I remember. Uh, uh, look, it was an, an awesome final. But uh, uh, for a lot of people that don't remember, um, you stayed on then and shot the skeet as well. You just did. didn't have, you, you actually shot everything. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the technical stuff. Um, you were one of the first people that I can remember shooting a higher rib gun. You had a Parazzi yeah. that had a higher rib. And now, of course, they're quite common. But... What made you change to a higher rib gun? Believe it or not, it was that uh, it was that really bad Fanyana World Championship. Thank you for bringing that up again. Uh, wow, that hurt. Um, no, it, it was it was it, honestly it was there. We we like you said we did the World Cup earlier there. Uh, shot out of my mind, which and and a lot of people told me I was go, I was crazy for doing it. You know, I grabbed a couple of World Cups off shooting a low rib Mirage. I think I had a two millimeter step Mirage that I was shooting at the time. And I uh, was shooting the same thing for doubles, actually. And uh, also another famous quote you had was uh, world. God, you are good, brother. Now I understand why you do a podcast. Uh, this is, you remembered in 94, we shot uh, doubles in Munich at the World Cup finals. And I think I led the first hundred 
and literally couldn't break 40 out of 50 and don't know if I ever broke 40 out of 50 again in my entire career. And it just fell off the end of the map. Getting back to that, I was shooting a low rib gun then. Thanks again for that. Wow. I'm, excuse me. I'm going <laughs> to kill the memory with a little tequila. Uh, no, it, um, it was in Fignano. It was at world championships. And I remember thinking, wow, I do have one problem. Every now and then when I get jumpy, I hide the target. And I personally always shot off the mark. I held down on the mark. I was never a high gun shooter. Um, I would move my eyes to adjust my timing, but I was always an on the mark guy, sometimes to the back of the mark. I think I held a high gun maybe twice in my career. And I remember telling Maro, God, I feel like if I jump this thing and I hide it, I'd sure love to be able to have a chance to see it. And he said, well, we have this new MX-10. What do you think? And I said, can I have one? And one showed up. And that ended up being, uh, being what I found to be a little bit, a little bit more conducive to my style. And, and maybe, maybe is also a crutch to my little mistake. You know, I, I was kind of a jumper and being holding on the mark and not used to holding a high gun. I wasn't used to not seeing that target in the first four or five feet. So I would, I would panic a little bit. And that's kind of what led me to that gun. Obviously today they've gone fairly crazy all the way with the 05 and the 08, which boy, that's a whole nother story we can talk about. But I think the worst part about shooting one was having to listen to everyone else tell you that you couldn't. So did you change your gun technically between the disciplines? Like, did you change the measurements? No, you know what? Honestly, honestly, Lauren, I think I, I think I had retired doubles at the time that I got that high rib gun. I think I was done shooting doubles at the end of 94 and I got that gun at the end of 94, obviously, because World Cup finals went so well. Thanks again, Russell. And, uh, and I, I think that was the end of doubles. I don't, I don't know that I ever shot doubles with a high rib gun. I came back and played with it a little bit, but never, I, I, when it came time to, for 96, as much as I wanted to shoot three events if I could, um, I knew that I had to put some time in and I had to kind of wrangle myself in. As you said, I was known to be a little hot and cold, but I was also pretty scattered. And again, I had ADHD and still do, um, but I, I did, I, I needed to focus. And I think that's probably what kind of got me back into the, into the groove and, and, and may have been the reason that I was able to, to, to grab a medal. I'm keen on your opinion on this. Let's fast forward a long way after your career is over and you're doing other things, but I'm sure that you keep tabs on what's going on in USA shooting. In 2008 and 2012, the USA never had a men's trap competitor at the Olympic Games, which for everybody, including me, is just unbelievable. Yeah. What did they get wrong? You know, it, it's... It's unfathomable to think that the USA can't win a quota in the period of years that they had a chance to win a quota and then then go to the Olympic Games without a men's trap shooter. Did that really hurt the sport, in your opinion? It must have. It can't help. Well, no, yeah, absolutely. Um, we They had enough of a distraction um, with a young kid that we had named Vinnie Hancock, who some people have heard of, and we had Kim. Uh, and we had our army shooters that were at the time decimating the double trap program. So I don't, again, you know, you and I are more historic with our sport than most people are. And I hold that pretty sacred. I don't know how many other people really did. I don't know that they really paid attention to the fact that we had never not had a person go, not only for one Olympics, but two, my God. Well, twice in a row is incredible, I thought. Just to yeah. To not learn from your mistakes the first time, because from what I gather, Josh, they sent sort of like the B team down to the Pan Americans just to get the quotas and not wear out the A team, but the B team didn't quite perform. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you yeah. Television. I, I, you know, I and and again, I wasn't involved in a lot of decision making. I can I can only say that I think at the time our grassroots program was struggling. I think. We've always had a lot of talent in the United States. We still do have a lot of talent in the United States. I don't think they were developing it properly. Um, we were getting to a point where the athletes were controlling the organization. If you really want to know my, my, my truth about this, I sat in a meeting in 2000 with all of the USA shooting people. I, uh, we had a people from, U I want to say one person from USA track and field, one person from swimming, our entire board. Nancy Johnson and myself. And they finally turned to us and said, what do you guys think? And I said, the first thing that you did wrong 
is you allowed every athlete to put USA on their back or on their vest long before they earned it. When I was a kid, you could not put USA anywhere on your body at all until you made a full national team. If you were on a junior team, they had one that they would pin on your vest for the world matches and you took it off when you got home. You had to earn that. And I remember saying that in that meeting and having several people in there who were very prominent, and I don't want to throw them under the bus, but had been on Olympic teams and won Olympic medals that went, yeah, we don't know if that's really the reason. And I'm thinking, you guys are the effing reason that we believe that. How can you not believe that they took away the want? They, you know, how did it feel the first time you put AUS on your back? And you it, knew that that whole it's country the was psyche. behind you. A absolutely. But can I take that one step further? Now, I've asked Absolutely. this same question to um, Vinny Hancock when we interviewed him. I asked the same question to Kim. And I've asked it now to Derek Mine, who's now in your Olympic team. Great kid. Um, yeah. Kid, they're, they're adult. All great shot. And, you know, they've all missed out on teams at times. So I, I want to ask your honest opinion on this. You, you mentioned before the world's most successful trap team in the history of the sport has been the Italians. And they handpick their team. They get together in a room and they pick their team. The USA shoot at 500 targets and they pick right. their team that way. If you're right. trying to win the Olympic Games and it was Josh Lakatos's money, which system would you use? The Italian system or the American system to win an Olympic gold medal? Um, it would be a split between the two. I think it would depend on how many slots you had, but I think, I think for your number, if you had two slots, one of them gets a pick and the other one's fought out for the rest of them. For the majority of what we had, our system worked and the cream always rose. And for the most part, so did yours. Um, occasionally did somebody get hosed or have a bad time? Yeah, it happened on occasion. And, and a couple of times some people went that got their shot in life, let's say. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's literally what this sport is about. But we're not here to service the spirit of, so to speak, we're supposed to be winning medals. And so I think that's a tough question, man, because um, you're right. If it's your money and it's your people, what are you going to do? I think, I think it has to be a combination of the two. I think you know, yeah, for instance, Kim's not going this year. Can she still do it? Well, she's done it every time. Do you just put her on there, but then do you take somebody else that's actually put in all the work and that person might be ready to go win their medal? Do you take them out? That's a pretty subjective call. So that's a tough question, man. That's a tough question. I think it's a split between the two to answer your question. It's a good answer you've given because it's funny that that's actually how the Australians pick their Olympic team this time. Um, just further on your views on one other issue before we talk about what you're doing today. Um, you were lucky enough to see the old final system. In fact, yeah, you would have started just when the final system's really started. Good. You've seen three different final systems. Now, which, which is the best one for, first of all, a competitor? And second of all, which is the best final system to keep the sport surviving on television, which you're a big part of now? Who picked the bus that's going to run me over right now? Because this is, <laughs> this is tough, man. Well, George Digweed I... said the only reason you guys have finals in IWSF is because the sport's so boring and we've got to do something to make it interesting. That's what he thought about it. <laughs> George would say that, and I'd like to go back to 94 when we were having that conversation together, and he struggled one match and phenomenal the other. Yeah, thanks, George. Um, I... You know, the, th the theory of that new final was actually right. Everybody in every other sport goes into a final and they all go in at zero. You know, I think, I think it was something we just had to get used to. Um, we were used to being able to go in with a lead, with a pad. Um, personally, I thought it should have been slightly staggered. You know, I think, I think if you win in number one, you should at least have something over everyone else for all the hard work you just did for the day and a half or two before then. Um, I was a fan of the old system only because I lived through it. And obviously if you earned yourself a 123 or a 124 and a 119 got into the final, then you drop one target and that guy happens to run the first 10 or whatever and knocks you out. It's not the same. I don't, I don't, I don't think it is the same. I think our sport's a little bit different. Um, maybe a staggered final would have been better. 
or the old way. I, I don't know that I'm a hundred percent fan of completely wiping everyone neutral. I mean, somebody that's run a 123 or a 124 and somebody that has a 116, the that's that's a pretty big split. That being said, if you've run a 124, you damn sure better be able to hit 10 more. <laughs> it's 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 a toss-up, man. It, it really it, I think it changed uh I think it changed how you definitely how you approach it i think it should have changed how you train i think you're training for two different events now i think you're training for a sprint and an ultimate sprint and you don't really get that chance to come back anymore um which i mean russell we had this argument when we went from 200 to 125 you know we went from a a marathon to a little bit of a sprint now you've gone to an all-out sprint so what is you know it's not it changed the game i think and i think once the headspace gets better about it, it is what it is. When you were far from done, although you weren't shooting anymore, you took a huge interest in the sport. As you said, you paid attention to the history. You have a huge amount of knowledge. Sure. And you went on to coach in 2008 and 2012. When you've been coaching, you obviously have a wealth of knowledge. But which is more nerve-wracking for you, being a shooter or being a coach? A coach, a hundred <laughs> times over a coach. You, you have no control. You have no ability to adjust on the fly and you're praying that your pupil can. And that was probably more nerve wracking. I mean, I, I can fail as a person and, and, and make a recovery. To feel like you failed someone else was the hardest for me. I took every athlete I ever had very personal, um, which was probably not my best trait internally um blood pressure wise and so on uh but no i I really did i I took every one of them very personal and and it it took way more out of me coaching than it ever did competing um i can be 100 percent accountable and responsible for my own actions for me to have to help somebody else and then deal with not only a psychology a physiology an emotion uh, whatever the heck is going on in their mind, that was so much tougher on me. Maybe if I didn't care as much, uh, I would have been easier on me. I just don't think I would have been the same person. And it's just not who I am. There's no way I could have done it. So definitely, without a doubt, coaching was uh, was way tougher on me emotionally. Yeah. Josh, before we let you go, I'm very interested to what you're doing in your life now. I know at one stage you were racing sprint cars around an oval track. And now you see just about every Hollywood film that that takes place, you're heavily involved in the background. Tell us about your stunt work and the work you're actually doing behind the scenes on Hollywood movies. Um, I got lucky enough. I went... When I, when I was still shooting, and, and the story goes, and, and I'll tell it, my father told me when I was probably 14, 15 years old, he said, you know, we, we can't afford to race anymore. I can't pay for that, but I can definitely let you shoot. So maybe if you shoot well enough, someday you can go racing again. Okay, cool. Uh, in 1996, I got my medal. I was hanging out a lot with a prone rifle shooter named Billy Meek, who a lot of people knew. He was in the finals as well in Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, and in 92, as a matter of fact, and we bought a race car together and I went racing and I did that all the way through 2000. And, and I still do it today. I just, I, I raced a little bit earlier this year. Um, it, it was a passion I always had. Um, can I just stop what, you, you know, with the yeah. eye injury you had, were you worried yeah. that that was going to be a problem? I mean, when you're, there's not too many sports more dangerous than, than racing. And you've mentioned the eye injury. Yeah. Was, was it a risk to keep, doing things that could endanger yourself even further? I think it was a point that I just didn't care anymore, Russell. I, I, I had done what I wanted to do in shooting. It was great. It was a good time, but it was never my passion. Sorry to say. It was never, ever, ever my passion. I wanted to be race cars. I wanted to do adrenaline stuff. What got me, well, actually what kept me shooting was the adrenaline of getting on a podium. Um, that, that was probably the only thing that kept me so focused for that long was being able to know, wow, I really may have been the best today and there's nobody else. So that drove me, but I always did want to drive race cars. Fast forwarding a little bit, I got into fabricating and building and such, and I came back to coaching, but was still fabbing and building race cars. I got a call from an old friend of mine, named, oh, an old friend, still a good friend, David Pope, who was a decathlete who I met through Oakley, 
who has an identical twin brother who's been in a ton of movies that you've seen. And they had built something of a camera vehicle. And they said, hey, you're a fabricator. You should come back here and work on it. So I went back there and worked on it and kind of got snuck onto set. And I built a complete vehicle for them. And they brought me down on a movie called 21 Jump Street, which ended yeah. up doing pretty well. And they snuck me on as a driver and I just kept my mouth shut. And by the end of the movie, I had earned a SAG card and apparently I was pretty good at it. And off we went. So I ended up doing a lot of stunt driving, but also fabricating and building things for the stunt world. And I got hooked up with a camera car company called Pursuit. And the owner had also fabricated his own stuff. So we ended up becoming super tight friends, started working for him. And, the, and it's, it's gone absolutely crazy since. Um, I, I couldn't be happier. And is that what you plan on continuing to do? Is that something you're going to do for the foreseeable future? Uh, until I literally can't roll out of my bed anymore, I will do stunts forever. Yeah, no, it's, um, it, it, it came to a point where they said, you know, can you act? Can you take a hit? Can you take a fall? Can you take a fall 10 times in a row? Can you flip a car? Honestly, what really came, the culmination of all this was the ability to be able to have one chance to do one shot and not screw up. And for me, that's not that difficult because that's what we did. We were under pressure all the time. So that was actually the easy part for me. Um, apparently I'm likable, love that. And it all just kind of, it all just kind of rolled into a career and, and it kind of was everything I've always wanted to do. I love the adrenaline. Um, I don't mind getting hurt. Um, I don't, I love speed. I love, you know, everything about it. And it just became everything that I was as a person. And they're going to send me a ridiculous paycheck. Yay me. I, that, that kind of sealed the deal. So yeah. <laughs> it's what we get in shooting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Let me know when those show up. Cause I might come back if they ever got there. Josh, it's remarkable that you've ended up as a stunt driver. You couldn't walk from your bedroom to open the door for Lloyd Woodhouse without breaking your feet, and you've ended up being a stunt driver. So, mate, it's been tremendous to catch up with you again. You were absolutely one of the biggest personalities in the sport. Everybody missed you when you gave it away. And it's sort of hard to believe it's been like 16 years since you were really sure Crazy. The world circuit but you left um you left your print on the sport you and as i say to get into the, this group of five people you had to be world class at one discipline and i i think you were world class at three disciplines but yeah. um it, it's been fascinating to hear your story and I, I hope the people like usa shooting could at some stage in the future listen to you or maybe even get you on the board because it is people like you that that put the input into the sport that will will actually shape the future of it. And your views yeah. this evening have been fantastic. Well, thank you. I honestly, if, if I, if I could leave your shooters with anything, <clears throat> you know, it's, it, it's a different world now. Um, it's uh, I, I have a little bit of sympathy for some of the younger shooters coming up because you're coming up in a time where social media and, and the way that people look at you really dictate, who you are, but more so, I think it, it really affects uh, how you feel about yourself. And we honestly didn't have those issues back in the day. Learn patience <clears throat> to, to know that you can put anywhere from six to eight years of your life at something. I promise you, if you do it, when you feel that reward, it will be the best feeling you've ever had. It will far beat a thousand likes on a Facebook photo or Instagram or whatever the hell they're using now. I think that that's lost in some of the younger generation. I don't know how to convince them of that because it's a hard, it, I think it's really hard to make somebody or to, to show somebody that unless they put those two to four to six years in. I promise you it's worth it. It's, it's been the one thing that probably defined all of us. Um, I think you could, you could do your next interview with all Olympic medalists and you could have this conversation with them and it would be to go, yeah, I threw my whole life out there. I gave, didn't give it up. I mean, we still did fun stuff and we still had a great time, but we really put four, eight, 10 years of our lives into something for about one national anthem. It was worth everything. And even though I didn't hear my own, you're welcome. Uh, it, was, it was worth it. And every time we did hear ours, it was worth it. Every podium you got on was worth it. But the amount of time you have to put into it to be able to get to that level is not what's expected. It takes everything you have. It's sad to me to see 
the way that the Olympics have been treated now is more of a passing thing, you know, with X Games and all the other stuff that's out there. I think people forget it's every four years. You have two days or one day every four years to show them everything you've put out. That's something that needs to sit there for a second before somebody comments on it. And, and I, I really wish more people would understand that. And I wish that some of the younger, uh, younger generation had a chance to, to really, uh, you know, to embrace it and, and go for it because that's really what it was all about for me. Yeah, it's, it's sincerely good advice for any young shooter. And um, one thing I will say, Josh, thank God they didn't have social media when you and I were out there. <laughs> it was so true. about a week, I'd say, and we'd be banned forever. <laughs> Josh, it's been fascinating catching up with you. Please say hello to your dad, Steve, who's oh, ice skating as one of the best IWSF referees I've ever seen. So it, well, thank you. Pass that on. Josh, all the best. And we look forward to um, the next Hollywood movie that you'll be in the back. <laughs> I, know, uh, I know The Joker was a film you did a of times that yep. went very well. Josh, all the best. Really appreciate your time this evening. Thanks for having me. If you guys do this again, I'd love to come back. I miss both your faces. It was great catching up. And uh, yeah, if you got another subject that I happen to tie into, let's do it. Game on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All the best, Josh. Thanks. Thanks very much. You as well. Miss you guys. Take care. <laughs>